Hello, everybody, and welcome to our wonderful day of celebrating Anne Meek and her new book, Tree Full of Stars. Uh, we're, today, we're going to be celebrating uh, the book and also uh, uh, also Anne's life of poetry. Um, this live stream event is brought to you by the Meek family, the Muse Writer Center, and Hampton Roads Writers. Throughout the afternoon, we'll hear some of Anne's work as read by some of her many friends in the community of poetry. My name is Michael Candlewall, and I'm the executive director of the Muse Writers Center, which is a literary center here in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and even though we're in Norfolk, we now, being online, uh, are all over the country, and we welcome you at any time. And I'd like to welcome Lauren Strait, the president of HRW, to say a few words about Anne Meek. Let's welcome Lauren Strait. My husband's clapping. <laughs> okay, um, I just want to say that I met Anne in 2008 at the fourth event Hampton Roads Writers ever had. And she was, um, she, she had just, she and Gil came to the event. It was an open mic. And at the end of the event, she thought it was such a fun time that she and Gil immediately joined Hampton Roads Writers. And then toward the very end of the meeting, as I was getting ready to leave, Anne came up to me and said, how can I help? So I said, well, would you like to join the board? And of course she said, yes, I would like to join the board. So she's been on the board for the last 12 years. Um, she then quickly recruited me to join the Cultural Alliance of Greater Hampton Roads. And she recruited a whole bunch of other literary artists to join that board. And that was because she's so passionate about the literary arts and she wanted to make sure that they had a voice in the arts community of, you know, in the area. Um, and then after we had our conferences, she and Gil always opened up their house to us for a post-conference party. And it was such a fun time that we all had. And right now I wish I had some of her ham and biscuits. They are so delicious. Anyway, thank you so much, Anne, for all you've done for Hampton Roads Writers over the years. And we're pleased to be able to help you with this book launch. Thank you so much, Lauren. Mm -hmm. um, I just lost my... There we go. <laughs> so, um, so I've known Anne for what seems like my whole life, even though it's probably uh, just 15 years or so. <laughs> she, she was also instrumental in, in me joining Hampton Roads Writers and the Cultural Alliance Board, uh, where it really made possible some of the growth the Muse uh, um, experienced because she helped me connect to all the other arts organizations in the area and all the people who run them and uh, allowed uh, the muse to become part of the cultural community, the art, the arts community in Hampton Roads. But most of all, she is a great friend to me uh, and to the muse and to the poetry community, uh, both in Hampton Roads and in Virginia. Um, and her kindness and her uh, welcoming spirit has always been something that I aspire to. Um, you know, you, you look for role models over your life and um, and she's definitely been one of mine. Um, just in the way she treats others and the way she treats the arts, um, just with, again, with kindness and compassion and, and that welcoming connecting spirit. You know, there are certain people out there that, that, that really just naturally bring people together. Like she brought uh, Lauren and I together in some ways and she brought our organizations together and, and, and the way she brings poets all over the, the country really together. Um, it's something that I just admire. And, you know, when I think sometimes, you know, how, what would Anne do? How would Anne treat this person? How would Anne um, connect the, these people? And I really appreciate her for that. Um, so now it's time uh, to start our reading. And, and while I'm gonna be introducing everyone who will read this afternoon, I'm especially excited and honored to introduce you all to the poet herself. Anne Meek, who will read her poem, Patchwork, from her new book, which I'm holding up now, and hopefully you can see it, uh, her new book, Tree Full of Stars. So here's Anne Meek reading Patchwork. Thank you first to everyone for being here, joining this. It means so much to me to be able to share my work with you. And I'm gonna start with that old favorite, Patchwork. A poem is a quilt of words words chosen for their shape and feel and color, unsuitable ones thriftily reserved among other scraps of existence, placed carefully for ear pleasure and eye delight, stitched securely but with ease, a heart jolt or two in the pattern, 
and for the same reason, to keep you warm against the world's cruel cold. <laughs> Thank, you All right, so Zach. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne. And now it's my honor to introduce Anne's daughter, Lisa Roney, who's going to talk to us about uh, the Tree Full of Stars project and also after that read uh, her mother's poem, Bittersweet. So let's welcome Lisa Roney. Thank you. Um, Tree Full of Stars has really been a lifetime in the making. Most of you know this already, but mom has been writing long before I was born. Um, and poetry was always in our home as Kelly and I grew up and was shared widely beyond our home. Some of my fondest memories are of going to poetry workshops with my mother and Eric was at those too. Um, yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, that community of poetry and poets gathering for, we would usually have brunch on a weekend and talk about poetry. And I was in high school then. So <laughs> it was formative for me. And it's always been my model of what talking about our writing should be like. Um, so when mom said that she wanted to collect all of her poetry, it was a big task. We knew it was going to be a big task. <laughs> and so last fall, she and Kelly and I set out to do it. <laughs> um, what we discovered surprised even us with its range and depth and sheer volume. So it's been taken, it's taken a while. It's uh, been a big project, uh, but we finally produced what I hope is a beautiful testament to both mom's work and her spirit in general. Yes, yes. When we first started trying to organize and find a shape that would emphasize the meaning of all these different poems together, we discovered five childhood poems that um, mom had written between about the ages of eight and 12 and that were still in her papers. And <laughs> Kelly and I sort of simultaneously recognized that these really defined her main themes and interests of all of her work and probably her life as well. Um, and so we organized the book into five sections, the first one being her childhood memories, her heritage, her family growing up in Martin, Tennessee. And then that led us into the second section, which is really poems about nature and about place, um, especially a lot of poems about Tennessee, but she moved into other parts of the world as well. <laughs> um, and then section three is about mostly the non-family people from Josie who worked for mom's family when she was a girl, through her grad school mentor, through kids that she taught in school. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, a host of people who influenced her and who she no doubt influenced in her life. And then the fourth section kind of carried from that and is about all the poets and the poetry and the social issues that she at was attuned to and they came together um, because she believed in Head Start education. She believed in poets in the schools and she believed in bringing poetry to people who might not otherwise have exposure to it. Oh yes, my, my, some of my students. Yeah, absolutely. And then the fifth and final section of the book is really all about being an adult. It's about being a mom. It's about growing and maturing over the course of a lifetime. And um, so, as she has often said, it's really also an autobiography as well as a collection of poems. Yes. <laughs> and I hope everyone will enjoy both the book and everything we have prepared and everyone we've brought together today um, for you to hear. I will be reading um, a poem called Bittersweet. See the child? in the old photo in the faded blue frame. She is still, unsmiling, her eyes unwavering, poised forever in the little chair on the hearth beside the fireplace. See the hammered brass urn high on the mantel far to the right, filled with leafless curving strands of bittersweet spilling up and flowing out. The orange husks have burst, burst open, surrounding improbable red berries in some sort of triumph over summer, <laughs> some sort of affirmation of seasons, some sort of celebration. 
and time's passage. The mother who put the bittersweet in the urn and then on the mantle is the same mother who set the child in the chair, smoothing out her skirt, lifting up her chin, just a touch, saying, it's for the Christmas card. There now, that's my girl. <laughs> she stands back to see the effect. The mute and somber child, pine paneling, old bricks, the brass, and the curling strands of the wild plant the father had dug up in the woods and set to thrive on the trellis in the backyard <laughs> for the pure pleasure of the mother. Ah, lovely. Time's passage took bittersweet from the mantle. The father gone, the mother gone, the backyard gone. Then last fall in Blowing Rock, the season coming to an end, the shopkeepers getting ready for winter. Under the rolled awnings, there we found bittersweet again, huge swaths of bittersweet. It is enough now to have bittersweet in the house. Here, the same orange husks burst open around the same daring red berries in the same triumph over summer, the same affirmation of seasons, the same celebration of time and time's passage. No, no, it is not enough, but it is all there is. <laughs> thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, and thank you, Anne, for writing such a, such a beautiful poem. Oh. Um, our, our, our next reader is going to be Anne's son, Kelly Roney. Um, and I somehow lost my notes again. Ah, here we go. Uh, who'll be reading, Then It Was November. Let's welcome Kelly. Oh, OK, good. Thank, thank you, Michael. Uh, the poem I'm going to read has long been my favorite of mom's poems. It's an important part of my life, not just because I'm one of the innocent children picking a ripe tomato, unknowingly then on the threshold of losing that innocence to grief. We've all had this turning point in our lives. Mom's gift is to turn the passages we all share into art that explains to our heart what living is like. Mom once told me, it's no coincidence that there's poetry in the scripture of any religion. And the, and the resemblance runs both ways. This poem has been my prayer for my grandfather for 45 years now. Then it was November. He was a man who understood nurture, taking the nature of a plant as given, providing soil and light and water to produce health, growth, and fruit. At home in June, he showed me new leaves on the candlestick trees once orphaned by my fitful care, thriving now for him. He took the children down the hill to pull the first tomato, exulting in their firm young hands around the firm young fruit. With his left hand, he gripped my arm, inscribing flourishes with his right, marking the growth of a green young pine, 18 inches in two months. Then it was November and you and I drove home through the darkness the daylight revealing his, his death and the young pine tree no longer green. Inside the storeroom, dampish smells of rose food and stale sweat upon old clothes shrouded tools, trunks, and his inventions. There I found his ax, graced with the patina of his care. So I, whom he had loved, with the ax which he had polished, obliterated the traitorous brown needle tree intolerable evidence of nurture's failure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, that was beautiful. Um, our next poem is going to be read by Marilyn Hammonds, and the poem is Anne's poem called Letter to My Brothers. Let's welcome Marilyn. Thank you. Anne wrote letters to my brother years ago, and it has always been my favorite Anne poem. As I read it, I always feel a closeness to her and our family. This is written after she makes a return trip down a long dirt road she had traveled many times as a child. At the end of the road was her favorite aunt's house and the nearby cemetery where family members were buried. 
the aunt, who just happened to be my grandmother, had been dead for years, but the return visit stirred memories, thus the poem. I parked the car under the ash tree and looked back at the road, the dust silently detonating into the air behind me. In childhood, it was the same. I didn't think of the dust until we stopped and faltered in that interval between journey's end and arrival. Then, surprised at the brown presence following us, I would watch the hot dust rising, writhing, sure to become a twister, sure to head straight for me on the strong beam of my fear. Even now, a brown presence shadows me. I slam the car door, I opened the gate in the fence Dillard put up 12 years ago when Uncle George died after waiting for Aunt Charlie and two months more. Aunt Charlie's house. The house endures, fenced off, wires stretched across old Sundays, maps of creepers sending us road signs. This far to the hayloft, this far to the feather beds, this far to squirrel for breakfast. <laughs> when I walk by, the flies on cow dung move aside. Among the brambles, my hands wince with the reprimands of forgotten hens. <laughs> Rider webs drip to earth like voices falling from the porch with the weight of family stories. <laughs> Ash saplings shade the faces of unseen relatives. In the breadth of ancient boxwoods, Sassafras thrives and a Bob White. His wings make the sound of the new south while our tongues grow thick with words unsaid. We are still family, wrapped in vines of air miles and ambition. Fenced off among the cattle, a deer looks up. Freeman Cemetery. The tombstones rise, clustered by family names like wild plants springing up from roots that lie like strong webbing under the grass, sending forth new shoots from time to time, all related to the first tenestuous parent dropped here years ago by accident. My eyes glance over the granite oblongs like pebbles cast against a hopscotch. Felix and Aunt Tim, the uncle killed at Bryce's crossroads, Aunt Charlie's stillborn baby. I know now, but cannot tell you why our father always brought us here. Over the road, I see the brown dust coagulating into the path, into the pale and lustrous moon, the past rising in summer sky. Thank you very much, Marilyn. This beautiful poem, of course. Uh, our next reader is Joan Worley, who will be reading According to the Constitution by Anne Meek. In the late 1960s and early 70s, Anne lived in Knoxville, Tennessee. Parentheses, then as now, utterly charming. And then a young mother, wife, grad student, and poet close parentheses. In a neighborhood too old to be called a development, it was built on a peninsula of land that jutted out into the Tennessee River. The houses were mostly traditional two-story neo something or other, Georgian or Tudor, mostly traditional two-story. Um, the residents too were mostly old and traditional and mostly well off. Many had servants, not a once a week cleaning lady, but an all day, five or six days a week maid to cook and clean and mind the children and a gardener to, mind, uh, to tend the yard. The poem I chose is understandable without a context, but at that time in Knoxville, Tennessee, where Anne lived, well, Jim Crow was just the way things were. Everyone lived in two clearly defined worlds, white or black, mostly white. According to the Constitution, 
the bus lunges from Kingston Pike onto Cherokee Boulevard through the granite pillars at 7.56 a.m., entering Sequoia Hills full of maids and gardeners, every face black, except the drivers. The bus lurches from Scenic Drive onto Kingston Pike underneath the stoplight at 8.23, leaving Sequoia Hills full of businessmen and professors, every face white, except Margaret Newman's maid, and she gets off at the pike. Now, we wouldn't want to be hasty. We've made a lot of progress in Knoxville since 1954. And as anyone can see, integration occurs daily at the intersection of Kiwi and Kennesaw at precisely 8.02. Thank you very much, uh, Joan, for that poem. Our, our next poem is uh, gonna be read by Eric Forsberg and the poem is called Talking to the Cat at the Picnic Table by Ann Meek. So I, uh, I've known Ann since about 1975. I was the poetry editor of the university uh, uh, literary arts magazine, uh, which was called The Phoenix. So I would get a lot of, um, I'd been through the Navy, so I was four years older already. So uh, anyway, but I would get a lot of uh, poems from, you know, college freshmen and sophomores. And well, you can probably guess, you know, what they were writing about their own personal concerns. <laughs> so, um, but then I started getting these poems from Anne and I thought, you know, th these, are, these are poems with an adult perspective. And so I really started uh, accepting a lot of her poetry. And finally, when I did meet her, I was just thrilled and we struck up a friendship immediately. And so uh, the reason I chose this poem, Anne, is it has your very distinctive voice, your very distinctive voice. And, um, um, and the other thing, it is about Tennessee. And so when I was growing up middle Tennessee, about every third barn had an enormous sign on the side that said, Sea Rock City. <laughs> That's so typical Tennessee. And the name of the poem is called Talking to the Cat at the Picnic Table. What do you want, old raggedy cat? You walk through the woods, a hairy menace to the foolish. But you have jumped up here like a kid whose bubble has left a pink web on his face. You need the burrs pulled out and a good chin scratching. When you aren't looking, I will squeeze your deceptive paws. I was wondering about that wood you were lying on. How long will a redwood stain obscure the perfect gray of the pine? Underneath the California color, the boards are taking on the luster of provincial barns, unguarded by signs to see Rock City and much scrubbed by the westerly winds across Tennessee. Paw to hand, Soyuz to Apollo, you have your circuit and I have mine. In the overlap, we coincide at this table where the essence of weathering wood throws off the rusty red wash. Observe, if you will, old raggedy, the similarities of our requirements. Two decent meals a day, fresh water, occasional assistance with burrs, and a sheltered place to sleep. Beyond those, to be left alone here with the woods around, and every day the hunt. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, our next poem will be read by Vicki Hancock, and that poem by Ann Meek is Pockets to the People. Let's welcome Vicki Hancock. Unmuting here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lisa and Kelly for inviting me to read a poem that has been so meaningful to me from Anne's new collection. I'm Vicki Hancock and I've known Anne for about 32 years. I met Anne in 1989 on the stairs of the ASCD offices 
on North Pitt Street in Alexandria, Virginia. It was a Sunday in June during my interview with then Executive Director Gordon Coelty. Remember Gordon? He hired me for a position that would have Anne and me occasionally working together, sharing time in many meetings, and more importantly, striking up a friendship that persists to this day. Anne has been a coworker, a drinking buddy, a confidant, and at times a surrogate mother to me, and I'm so grateful to have her in my life. Some of our most revealing conversations took place at Union Street Public House in Alexandria over cocktails in an after work group Anne christened Women Against Character Improvement, also known as Wacky. We sipped with Paula, and Marsha and Sally and other colleagues and talked about the few men at ASCD, most of whom were in leadership positions. When Anne chose to leave ASCD for an opportunity in California, it was this poem that I found at my luncheon seat for her going away celebration. This is Pockets to the People. Pockets are made to hold power. Power shaped like coins, keys, knives, nail clippers, pens, watches, wallets, condoms, and tape measures in hungry cases. Whatever power he needs, waiting submissively at the end of his arm. That's why they call power wearing the pants. Pockets are put into pants to hold power. You won't often find pockets in women's clothes. Pockets filled with power would mess up those famous feminine lines, portentous symbols of the one true pocket nature gave to each of us, it too to be filled with a masculine implement. Pockets to the people, sisters, power to everybody. I can't tell you how many times I've thought of this poem, especially during my career. Thank you, Anne, for writing it. Thank you very much, Vicki. Uh, that's wonderful. Our next, <clears throat> excuse me, our next poet, uh, our next reader, who is also a poet, is Jack Callan, and he'll be reading Anne's poem called Time to Write. Let's welcome Jack. Hello, um, quite an honor to be here. I was very lucky when I came into poetry. I met Pete Fries and Anne Meek. Pete, the wild wizard who pulled us all together, Anne was a craftswoman who would ignite a room and tell everybody how much she liked their poem. She has a teacher's voice that is heard above the noise of the room. She is a voice we all need to hear. I hear you, Anne, thank you. Now let's fly a kite. Time to write. I attach myself to the kite, tie four knots tightly. Run fast, gather speed, lift off into the sky. Rising above all the insoluble, indelible obsessions and impressions of Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z. I sway, sail, soar, let go. My own indelibles, insolubles, my breath ripples up rushes out in joy. I lean on the spar, bump down gently, sunlit again, landing in San Diego after 26 days straight of East Coast rain. This time it's the bright light of words, beaming up from old notebooks, sinking out of dusty journals waiting for me. I skein the strings on my finger, coil the tail, and stand the kite in the corner, and reach for pen and paper. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, our next poem will be read by Sharon, Sharon Poach. Um, I, I always forget if I should be saying puck or poach, so I apologize, Sharon. And uh, the poem by Anne is called Josie's Wake. Let's welcome Sharon. Thank you, Michael. And you said it perfectly. Um, 
I don't know Anne as long as most of you have. I became acquainted with her through HRW uh, and those wonderful after parties from the conferences. Then I took a workshop, a traveling pen workshop from her. And that's when I became acquainted with her poetry and was just struck by it. Anyway, of all the poems in this beautiful collection, it was hard to choose. But I kept returning to Josie's wake. It tugged at my heart and refused to let go. So Anne, this is for you. Josie's wake. Josie sat up on the edge of the casket. She was already an angel in a white Sunday dress. She said the flowers sure were pretty. And she had to go and tell the children that story all over again about how I wouldn't stay in the baby buggy and how she had to carry me home, pushing the buggy and embarrassed. She never said a word about how much dollar it cost. She just began to swing her feet and twinkle her eyes and turn her head slowly from side to side to look at everything real good. The people began to moan and dark music came up out of their throats. Macon and Lillian started in crying and Josie said not to. It was just her turn to go now. Like when Macon went off to Chicago and she had kissed her and gave her some blackberry jam. A woman took off her coat and played on the piano, except when the preacher was praying. And Josie lay down and closed her eyes and kept her glasses on. Thank you so much, Sharon. You're welcome. Our next uh, poem will be read by George O'Kady. Uh, and the poem by Anne Meek is The Standard Error of Measurement. Let's welcome George. Thank you. I met Anne and Gil uh, through HRW. And my impression and my experience with her leads me to understand what a great catalyst she has been to the literary community uh, in the Hampton Roads area. The standard error, error of measurement. You just can't count on numbers. They'll fool you every time. The value of a dollar, your mother's age, the children's sizes, time zone from zone, IQs, non-consecutive pagination, temperature and wind chill factor, estimates on the SST. Paxton Quigley score, the body count from Vietnam. You just can't count on numbers. Their word is not their bond. 50% brighter, fourth grade level. Dow Jones averages. The hour you'll see the doctor, the day you'll see the painters. ACTs and GREs, a woman's safe period. T tests, F tests, chi squares and SDs, significant and insignificant differences. You just can't count on numbers except in one small way, indices of insecurity, inadequacy, incomprehensibility. Confronted with chaos, we count, compute, calculate. Attacking mystery with measurement, consigning enigma to exactitude, postponing existential collision with X. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Um, our next poem will be read by Yvonne Forsberg, and this poem is called From Lisa's Porch by Anne Meek. Let's welcome Yvonne. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, uh, as, you, uh, as you know from before, uh, I met Anne through my husband, Eric, and interestingly, Anne was one of the first of his friends that he really wanted me to meet. And I remember going over to Ann's house and, and uh, Kelly was there. He was a high school student and Lisa as well. And so we've known each other for quite some time. But anyway, the, the poem I'm gonna read is one of my favorites from your book, from Lisa's por uh, Porch for Gil. A lazy sundown wind meanders through the trees in the backyard, rattling leaves and branches and pushing puffs of gray and white across a sky of constant blue. Suddenly, my cell phone vibrates and I'm startled. The wind's in my pocket? No, it's someone searching for me. It's you, looking for a connection, for love. We talk about the day while sun and clouds skip and shine, 
now light, now shadow, separating, then coming together across the tree frame sky. Listen, did you hear that whistle? The evening and tracks arriving in Winter Park, echoing that lonesome wail of trains we heard in childhood, long before we met, long before this even tide of our lives. Now at dusk, I want you with me, so far yet so near. Until the sun is gone, the wind is quiet, the night takes over, and the owl speaks again and again from within the darkness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, the next poem is called Sweet Gum, and it's actually going to be read by me. So it's my honor to read this poem by Anne Meek called Sweet Gum. Let me just get it on my screen. Perfect. Sweet Gum. This year at last, the promise of this tree is beginning to show. Green leaf stars give way to burnished burgundy, shimmers of ruby, here a blaze of outright red, there a swath of pale yellow turning to full gold. A few October leaf stars, leaf dancing against a morning glory sky. With the cold nights of November, more will show their colors before they twirl slowly toward the surface of the earth. Now can you see why this tree is worth saving? All by itself, this tree is autumn, asking nothing of us except to live, appearing among us without encouragement, committed to its own promise. Come look, come see, a tree full of stars here. What well, beautiful poem, and thank you for writing that poem. Um, so thank you. It, we, we've heard a wonderful celebration of Anne Meek's work uh, today. And before we conclude, I'd like to in, invite Lauren Strait back to the stage for a special announcement. So let's welcome back Lauren, please. Hi, thank you. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this afternoon listening to the works of Anne Meek read by her friends and family. And I'm very happy that HRW could play a part in this. Um, in honor of all of Anne's toil for HRW, I have an announcement to make, but first let me fill you in on some of the things that Anne has done for us over the years. I have to read this because I don't have it all memorized. <laughs> she emceed some of our open mics. She's taught workshops in poetry and memoir writing for the Traveling Pen Series. She judged one of our poetry contests. To celebrate Black History Month a few years ago, Anne organized an interactive writing experience for children at the Barnes and Noble. The children enjoyed the artwork by Maria Winfield, and then they were encouraged to respond to it in writing. She later initiated a poetry reading at the bookstore featuring African American poets, including Nathan Richardson and Shonda Buchanan. Uh, she played a major role in the youth poetry explosion at the Chrysler Museum, during which students were guided through the museum, and then they were encouraged to write poems about their reactions. And this event blossomed into two other events. So given all of that and so many more things that I don't have time to mention, it's with great pleasure that I announce on behalf of the board that this year's poetry contest will be known as the Anne Meek Poetry Prize. Oh, <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> that's wonderful. Wow. Well, that's a, it certainly is a, a wonderful honor. I, I, Lisa, uh, could you let us know where people can buy Anne's book? Um, yes, it is available on the Barnes and Noble website. Um, they don't have the book cover up but you can find it if you go to Barnes and Noble and type into the search bar and Meek or the title Tree Full of Stars. It should come right up. Tree and, Full of Stars. Yep. <laughs> Wonderful. And, um, and Michael, Michael, the direct link is in the email, although perhaps not the one that came to the panelists, but I could send it if you'd like me to. Well, I just think if people just go to Barnes and Noble and search for Anne Meek Tree Full of Stars, they'll yeah. probably find it. This is for our, our watching audience. I figured they would want to know where to buy Anne's book. Um, so Thank that's you. really great. Um, 
So as we conclude today, I, I, I just want to thank, uh, first of all, everyone who read um, so beautifully. It was, I mean, I, I would imagine it would be easy to read such beautiful words, um, and, and but you guys gave them the weight and the, and the, and the beauty that Anne intended. So thank you so much. Well, I want to thank you. I thank you all for your participation and your encouragement and your appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, I mean, uh, thank you for writing such wonderful, <laughs> wonderful words for us to read. Um, I also just want to thank everyone who put this event together, uh, Lisa Roney and the yeah. whole family, uh, all of Anne's family, uh, Susan Deutsch uh, from the Muse Writers Center and yeah. Lauren Strait from Hampton Roads Writers for all their hard work. But as I was saying when, uh, a second ago, I especially want to thank Anne for her wonderful life of poetry, uh, mm -hmm. for the words she wrote and allowed to be shared with us today. And as I said before, for her welcoming and connecting spirit that has managed to bring together so many poets and artists here in Hampton Roads and beyond. Uh, we love you, Anne. Um, and thank you all uh, who are watching. Uh, thank you for being part of our community and thank you for watching. So that that con concludes, unless Anne would like to say anything else. I don't want to cut Anne off. Well, I would just like to say thank you so much for this wonderful event, this wonderful recognition. Well, you're, you're, well thank you for allowing us to honor you. <laughs> we, <laughs> we appreciate that you... Um, have dedicated your life to the word. Oh, and, and right. I know that she's sorry that we're not hosting a party with ham and biscuits right now, <laughs> but we will be more than happy to hear from people by phone or Zoom over the next few days and a couple of weeks as so we can have personal chats about the book. And then we'll get ready for the next party. Yeah, yeah. that sounds good. <laughs> right. Once, everyone once gets vaccinated fear, and we'll meet at Ann and Gill's house. Yeah, <laughs> once, once the fear of the illness is gone, we'll be ready to party again. Wonderful. I'm glad Lisa said something about ham and biscuit because I've been thinking, nobody said anything about it. What a wonderful cook Ann is. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know we've yes. left out other things too. <laughs> well, I think Lauren said that at the beginning. So that's she why did, I was yeah. trying to come full circle. <laughs> okay. All, all the parties with the ham and biscuits. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, and there are, for food lovers, in this poetry collection, yeah. many, many poems about food. We didn't read too many today, but there are lots of poems about food. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, maybe all the, all, the, all the panelists, all the readers, and Anne, everyone can wave to the audience and, and say, and, and wish thank them you. well. Thank, thank you. you so thank, much. You. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Lauren.